Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, uh, Adeline. Thanks for the well, lovely remarks. Um, Dato Sharil is, is an enigma. He's, uh, he's got a unique position in Malaysia's corporate world, and uh, that is precisely the reason why we're talking to you today, Sharil, if we can be quite uh, conversational. Perhaps we can start with the fact that um, you've got this unique position, as uh, Adeline was saying, in the technology ecosystem where you've got up close and personal access to some of Malaysia's most uh, successful up-and-coming entrepreneurs, but also the fact that you can also have dibs into them at quite an early stage in terms of their possibilities, right? So perhaps let's get into your head in terms of um, what you look for when you invest in some of these businesses. And uh, we know you've got some, you've got interesting access and made invest, interesting investments in some of these players. What do you look for when you, before you put your money in? Wow, he doesn't waste time, does he? <laughs> <laughs> Hi uh, to everyone, I'm Sharil. Um, don't believe half of the things they said. Um, half of them are true and half of them actually a bit more than that. Um, so Chuang, yes, uh, thank you. Um, and very happy to be here. Um, always been supportive of what Endeavour does and appreciate very much CGS CIMB for supporting us. Um, I always believe in, you know, uh, we, there's so many things that we can do ourselves and it's entirely up to us how we want to contribute to community. Some do it by way of uh, you know, uh, giving their time, giving their uh, knowledge, sharing their knowledge. Some, well, some go and become very good entrepreneurs. So to your question, I actually look at people. I will always focus on the individual and the entrepreneur because that is the genesis of where the idea comes from. And when I say people, I will also extend that to the execution team. So, um, because a good idea is only good in so far as articulating it, but beyond that, you must have the ability to execute. So, the person and the team, and that's one of those things I think that even at Endeavour, we always uh, stress. So, when you look at the person, right, um, what do you look for? What turns you on about the person? And let me just say, some of the ads we saw that ran earlier, you know some of them. You've invested in some of them. You talked about how there's one agency, ad agency, that, that has, um, is disrupting advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lady's named Melissa or something. That's right. Then you've also invested in a company called BookDoc, I think. Uh, yep. So what, what, what is the essence of the person that you, you know, analyze? Well, maybe I should clarify. It's the person and the idea that the person stands for. And uh, very often, it's the first question that has to be answered is what problem is that particular individual solving? That is one of the key things. And how is that person approaching the problem, the, the solution to that, to that problem? So uh, I tend to look at things which are, are potentially disruptive, potentially things that can change the status quo or what's happening today, but also uh, things that actually will provide um, the value add to the greater community, not necessarily economically, uh, but maybe providing them uh, with ease of access to uh, the, the application, the solution, the information. So one of the examples I saw just now in the video, I didn't realize that they were there, um, is a company called AdEasy. I met them many years ago and uh, several rounds. First round, I passed on them and they continued and they, they were around. Then second round, I passed on them again. Then third round, I said, okay, maybe they have something. Hey, and that was hey, why was did you pass on them on one and two? Validation. Remember I said that the person, the idea, the team, and then the ability to execute. <clears throat> so sometimes I do go in very early, uh, almost just right after ideation stage, but sometimes I uh, when, when there's so many out there, I actually have to go through a second layer of filter, which validating their, their theories and their execution modality. So uh, that's, that's typically how my thought process works. Okay, so in, in, in some cases where you pass on one and two and you come in on three, how much is the valuation expanded by then? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I tell you the one I missed? Yeah, go on then. Well, by the time I see them again, probably they've gone maybe 2x, 3x from the original. Um, but yeah, the one that got away a long, long time ago when I was doing stuff with ICANN and the internet, and this was in 2007, 2007, 2008. So I was doing a lot of traveling and I was working with... Uh, well, with MCMC, but seconded or uh, I was providing assistance to a lot of the uh, international bodies. So I came across a 
founder who said uh, that uh, you know they were trying to do something where they would improve messaging. And I said, okay. And I said, what is it? And then they said, uh, it's like uh, sending an SMS. But uh, instead of sending one SMS, you, sorry, instead of sending many SMSs to your friends to tell them what you're up to, uh, you only send one and your friends who follow you can, can then read what you're saying and you know, respond if they want to. So I said, okay, how do you plan to monetize? Founder said, no idea. And I said, uh, okay, you have no idea how you want to monetize. And how much are you looking for? I said, oh, we're looking at 300,000 US dollars, 50,000 blocks, six investors, uh, two in North America, two in Asia, two in Europe. So I looked at it, looked at it, looked at it, saw the concept. And how much equity were they willing to relinquish? At that time, it was, well, it was very early stage. It was pre-seed. So I think they were looking at giving us about... Um, one or two percent each, because the whole block would be about ten percent only. That's very expensive pre-seed. It is very expensive pre-seed. They were very confident of themselves, so I said, "Pass." So they were very confident. That's yeah. interesting. But um, uh, there is good reason why they are very confident. Elon Musk just offered to buy them out. Well, Elon has also offered to buy Twitter. So which one is this? Twitter. Ah, uh, sorry. It was Twitter. Okay. Okay. So this is Jack Dorsey. This was uh, uh, one of the guys who was in Dorsey's team because uh, I was spending a lot of time in, in Marina del Rey and San Francisco at the time, so he was meeting a lot of these guys. But, you know, in 2007, 2006, 2007, I had no clue what Twitter would be, right? No idea. The closest thing I thought was, oh, okay, SMS, more complicated SMS, so what, right? Of course, fast forward, uh, I still wonder how they make money. I mean, I'm, yeah, we all know that they've, they've listed, but uh, in actual fact, you know, the journey, uh, stuff, they could have, uh, there were others also like Twitter who did not make it. Yeah, but you could also say that if you had invested in anything in the valley at, at that era, chances are you would have made a bunch of cash anyway because most of them were, it were nascent and they did become, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth. Um, when, when someone like you looks at a company like that at that point in time, what is your appetite for risk? And how, how willing, how, how much of a bet is it for you? Because at that level, right, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like playing uh, roulette. Yeah, you've got, I think, 33 numbers to choose from, including zero. Um, you can't possibly cover every number because then you'd be defeating the purpose, right? This one halal forum, huh? you cannot talk gambling. Eh? No, I'm just <laughs> Conceptual terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, um, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think in terms of, um, well, money is one. I think the valuation is the other. So usually I, I try and draw a line. And it, again, we're talking about back then. Uh, I only started really investing. And in, I think uh, after I left MCMC, uh, it was in 2015. But I kept the relationships with all the uh, various parties I'd met. Because uh, you see, for those who don't know me, I actually spent time in the private sector. I was once a lawyer in Zico. I gave that up in the year 2000. I think some of them were not even born yet. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So anyway, so I, I, I stopped legal practice in 2000. I went into MCMC round one. I helped develop a lot of the policies that we see today. And at that time, Malaysia was really ahead where we were looking at having a converged regulatory environment. Telecoms, broadcast, media, internet, all coming into one. <clears throat> and there was nobody else doing that. Many years later, a lot of other countries followed suit, and that's what we have today. So along the way, as I was doing that journey, that uh, first foray into government, which I spent six years, I then got sent to do some you know, regulatory reform stuff with people like World Bank, the ITU, and, and the WTO, which was doing the negotiation for Doha round, and that's how I then got involved with all these other things. Yeah, so having spent some time up close, you know, with people like uh, Dorsey's team at, at Twitter, right, you would have had, obviously, experience and, and, and interacted with them at, a, at quite a high level. They would have pitched to you. What are the key differences between those teams and what you see in Malaysia in terms of personality? Like, because, you know, models can change and they can evolve, right? So, hand on heart, right, Cheryl? Where the key... Because you're trying to think about how to be honest without 
offending people, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go on then. Uh, <laughs> see, two guys with the glasses on top. Um, <clears throat> I'll be very bluntly honest. Uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs here have been mollycoddled too much. They are not as hungry as one would hope for. Uh, they're not as um, they're not as uh, well. I, I, I want to use this word carefully. Aggressive, you know, aggressive in a positive way, because our people here, and I'm generally speaking, more Malaysia, some in Asia, uh, because I do meet some people around here. Uh, they are not they're not out there to push their idea across because uh, they, they they you know if 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 I give somebody. I said, okay, you've got 45 seconds to pitch to me while I'm walking or going up the lift. And they go like, oh, cannot do lah. I need one hour. I said, no, I'm not going to give you one hour of my time. Whereas the US tech entrepreneurs, they know what they want and they're very clear about what their product is, what they want to sell, what it is that they're trying to, to do. You give me, they come up to you and say, have you got 30 seconds? Let me talk to you. And the moment I hear the first 30 second pitch, if it locks on, then we may, we may end up speaking for another half an hour. But it's also true that we can tell Matsalis are much better at talking than Asians are, right? I mean, Americans are amazing orators and they have been brought up that way. So is it a cultural thing, Sharil? No, no. Because it's not clarity of thought and knowledge of the model because both sides, you would assume they have that knowledge. It's about the confidence, the ability to orate you know, the ability to put things in, in, into, into words in a very concise way, things which we don't learn in our schools. Well, I think we did, but we probably forgot. Um, actually, it's about telling a story. That's what it is, right? So any of the entrepreneurs that come to me, and for example, in Endeavor, we have this uh, program called Scale Up, right? So I always tell the team, I say, before they come to me, I say, tell them, make sure they know what their 60 seconds pitch is going to be, otherwise don't waste my time. And, but you know what I get in the end? Oh, sombong lah. Oh, you only got 60 seconds lah. You know, sombong. So that's a cultural thing. Agree. But I think a lot of times, if, if you don't know... You see, even as a government officer back then, right? If I had to brief ministers, I had to brief the cabinet or something, I may have a slight deck of 45 sheets. Then if the boss says, uh, yeah, tell me, I'm going to my car now you really have to start thinking on your feet. And I think my experience as a litigator back then, as a lawyer, helped because, okay, what do I say in this guy between now and the car that will hook him to then say, come talk to me Monday when I'm back? You know what I mean? And that's the part that our guys somehow, you know, you have to take the chance that people give you. You cannot wait for a chance to be given, uh, you know, put to you on a silver platter. And that's the thing that's missing I think with a lot of our entrepreneurs. Do you also think there's different kinds of entrepreneurs in Malaysia? Because you've got these entrepreneurs who are, you know, your typical traditional businessmen, right, Cheryl? Who, who by necessity start a business because they, maybe their parents had no money to send them to university or they had, you know, they were maybe one of eight children so then they don't have money to go to school and so they, by, by necessity, they go out and they start a business and they fail and they try again and they fail and sometimes, you know, they eventually they make it, right? So these guys are not out there pitching for funds. They're not out there, you know, raising capital. They don't even know about valuation. They're out there making, doing business, seeking profit from as early as possible, getting top line as early as possible to pay bills, right? So that's the kind of entrepreneur that we don't really see in these forums, but they are replete. We see a lot of them in, 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 in the ace market, you know, the typical Chinaman business where, you know, they're very, very good at doing business, but they find these nooks and crannies, right? Do you think we've... So what I'm saying in summation is, do you think Malaysia is very, very good at, at, at fermenting entrepreneurs? Because you know, this is a country which has many opportunities. Well, uh, I think when you're looking at that kind of entrepreneur, again, you know, me, maybe this is a bit generalizing it, but every entrepreneur needs access to capital. You know, even, even your, the ones that you describe, right? Yeah. Ask anyone, and I have friends who are like that, uh, who, who have started business out of school, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to college. You know, I came from Ipoh. And uh, some of them could not go to college. Then they started a business. They were doing trading. They were selling stuff. They need capital too. 
they need access to capital. We don't call them entrepreneurs here, unfortunately. You know, we, we have this sexy term, you know, we like to use entrepreneurial ecosystem means tech. Actually, no. We call those kind of entrepreneurs SMEs, so they seem to have a different, you know, um, uh, label to it. But all of them are entrepreneurs, and I have great respect for entrepreneurs because I know how tough it is, having been one myself somewhere along my journey. But coming back to your, to your question, are we fermenting them? No, I think, you know, we, we are also, uh, I think many of us as Malaysians are probably also, because we are in a safe country, we're in a comfortable country, we're guilty of being complacent. You know, a lot of the entrepreneurs I meet, be it in the traditional space or in the tech space, when I asked them, I said, after 12 months, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Uh, okay, uh, we think, you know, it'll be okay, you know, we can get a few more states in Malaysia, okay lah. So I said, what about going to Singapore? What about going to Thailand? What about going to Indonesia? What about the region? What about global? And then they go like, uh, not even thought about it. Whereas those guys, I mean, US is different, right? And I deal with, I have three startups that I mentor in the US. They're very different. The, the founders of the startups uh, and the companies that I sort of work with in the US, they're very clear. They want to go for the US market, but they've always got this mindset that US market is a prelude to the global market. So back to our entrepreneurs, our entrepreneurs seem to think that if you're top in Malaysia, you're okay. Lah. But that's not true. you know. And we, we don't dream big enough. And I think a lot of the programs that we run, we try and say, what's your expansion into ASEAN? Because when, you, when you're doing, whether it's a traditional business, whether you're doing you know, manufacturing that plastic piece for the bottle, some of our guys are probably saying, ah, you know, if I can make um, a revenue of about five million a year, that's enough. They don't, I don't know why they don't think beyond. I would, I'd be curious. So far, so far, many of them, I was talking to the guy who does the, one of these, um, can I name a brand? No, maybe yeah, I should. Sure, um, you know, the motorcycle carrier. GV, yeah. right? So G that's a Malaysian business? That's a Malaysian business, a Malaysian brand. Not Italian. Uh. Chinaman. <laughs> uh, hi, if you're, seeing, if you're watching this. But yeah, but you know, the guy's smart. He says, ah, I sell with a Chinese brand, not going to sell. So I say GV. It's selling well. It's here. I mean, he bought certain rights from, from a, a partner, but it's, it's manufactured here locally. So he had the idea of thinking, and he's thinking of ASEAN. But you know, out of every 10 that I meet, I meet one. So why do you think that there's that complacency in Malaysian entrepreneurs? We get too many handouts. We get too many handouts. We but we continue to perpetuate it though. And um, you have said in civil service, right? Sharil, you've you worked in government, right? I've worked well, in why government. Why do you think yeah, they service. perpetuate it? Well, I, I, you know, because we know it, uh, it hobbles the, the country long term. Not even long term, medium term. You know, I, I think one, one of the things that we probably do, and this is not just Malaysia, but probably as Asians, I think we're, we're, we're very, um, generally Asians, and you know, many Asians I meet in the region, we're the kind of people who like to help people. We, you know, we, we want to offer people an opportunity. I think that's what we like to think, though. But maybe that's got an expediency to it. That maybe, maybe. But you see, if you look, if you look at what is, is how you do it, right? So, for example, um, Singapore. Um, they also have programs, but I think one of the things that they have done perhaps better in, in managing the programs is there are no freebies. There's discounts. There's assisted programs, you know, silver hair program when they were trying to get uh, all the older people to, to embrace technology and tech. They don't give out free laptops. They say you spend 50 hours doing community service, you earn so much of a coupon, and the coupon allows you to claim for a laptop and then you top up cash. So you make people work for something. You know, when, when I was uh, growing up as a, as a, as a kid, uh, you know, as a Boy Scout, you know, you go and earn your badge, you go and earn your merit thing, and... You have to do all jobs. I don't see people doing that anymore. So I think we, we, perhaps we need to review how we do some of the things because now people still say, hey, I'm eligible, I'm entitled, you must give me. Because I'm an entrepreneur, you must give me this program, that program. I think it's time to review them.
Well, only if you're that kind of entrepreneur that is out there raising money and uh, living on grants. But there's also another class of entrepreneur who do it because of necessity. And if they don't do it, they, they don't get to eat that night. I'm, I'm talking generally at a macro level, Cheryl, in terms of Malaysia's um, structures where there's a lot of programs to, you know, to make things easy. Lah, you know? there's, I mean, just look at the price controls now. We've set a ceiling price on chicken, 8 ringgit 90 per kilogram, right? That's killing the poultry producers, but it's expedient to local Malaysians because t times are tough, right? Prices are high and inflation is a concern, but it permeates the entire country. We've got that uh, entitlement I ideology which has... Um, crippled Malaysia, and you know, it, it doesn't. It, it it might make the inefficiencies in Malaysia's system might make for entrepreneurship because things are there's many things wrong with this country, right? But we don't. They don't stick around. We don't reap the benefits of them in the long term. Well, I, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at things half the glass as being half full rather than half empty. There are many great things wrong with many countries. You know, not 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 just us, not just Singapore, not just. Uh, the US, not China, everybody's got problems, right? I think it's a function of how we want to approach the problem and how we want to solve the problem, right? Um, I'm no expert on chicken or chicken prices, so I really can't comment. I mean, I do know the prices are going up, but I think there are things that, you know, if you, if you approach life looking at things, and I, I learned this from my teenage son, right? He's got, uh, um, I think being trained as a lawyer, you're generally a pessimist. Sorry, lawyers in the room. You know, you're generally a pessimist. You sort of say, oh, this is going to be a problem, so we need to draft a clause that deals with this problem. This is going to be another problem that we need. But, you know, as I evolved from where I started as a lawyer to a regulator, became an entrepreneur, corporate advisor, my perspectives in life changed. And one thing I learned from my young kids, uh, well, when they're not young anymore, but they grew up, you know, kids always have this view of, Oh, it'll be better tomorrow. It's how you look at it. And I really do believe that if you're looking at um, things from a glass half full kind of perspective, you tend to look for um, the solutions or the opportunities. But if you're looking at glass half empty, then you're looking down. You're looking no, like you're open. right. No, you're right. It would be nice to be positive, and, and there are many things to be positive about, about Malaysia. One only needs to travel abroad to realize we're very, very lucky to be in Malaysia. Even if you go to New York or London, you see how tough life can be. Yeah. There are people who are homeless and living in tents in San Diego on the streets. Um, but it's, it's a structural problem. We've, we've, uh, we've talked about our structural issues here. No, but I think it's not just a structural problem. I think it's, it's also our people forgetting to be thankful for what we have. And that's not something to be, to be, you know, uh, to be uh, trifled at. Uh, because when I used to travel doing a lot of work for ICANN and I was, you know... Mm, I was traveling as far as uh, Ghana, uh, some parts of Africa, Latin America. People have basically, you know, I walk into people's homes. The home is just a hut. The hut has got a floor that's made out of, well, it's not even a floor, it's soil, right? They just have a roof over their head. And if you look at what we have here, I mean, because some of our abject poor do do have uh, living conditions like that, but by and large, we don't, as you said, we don't have people, you know, um, destitute. But many of those countries, they, they are. But you know, when they get that little bit of assistance, they're so grateful. Our people, I think, uh, need to take stock and sort of say, hmm, you know, let's let's be grateful for the little that we have, or good or bad, because this is our country. It's up to us to see what we can do. And for all the entrepreneurs, I say the same. I say, look, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to be a grantpreneur because, and then you get upset because agency A, I'm not going to name them, agency A, B, C, D don't give you this, that and the other because you think you don't have political connections, like you don't have this, you don't have that. I say, stop, get out. I say, you're not being, uh, you know, you're not being, I said, you, you need to be more than that. You know? Do you think Malaysia needs to be Okay, I think there's a general consensus that Malaysia needs to wean itself off this, um, this, this policy of, of offering you know, things that it cannot afford to do over the long term, right? But that transition is very hard. Do you think we can ever achieve that? I'd like to think so, but it starts with every generation. <clears throat> you know, people, people have to... People have to realise that the subsidies cannot be forever. 
I think we're seeing that happen now with government, right? And government's already taken steps. Uh, one example is the fuel prices. Um, if you're looking at uh, Round 95, okay, you know, that's supposed to be for the lower income people. Um, then you've got Round 97 now is standing at what, 4 ringgit and 460, 460 now, right? Um, I think we need to, we, was it? But, but what, what our, we, we need to understand, and our people need to appreciate, that look, that is the amount of subsidy that's happening, and look, we have to be grateful, but this is not going to last forever. Same thing with healthcare in Malaysia, you know? Um, people go to a government hospital, they pay two ringgit, but the cost of that particular healthcare, say for that particular drug, is like 150 ringgit. You know what? They, they get upset if they don't get it. But try going to other countries. You don't get this kind of thing. Do you know what, Cheryl? You've actually got a very, very unique position in the landscape because you have access to these entrepreneurs and you are in the private sector, have been in the private sector, you've invested into them. It's in your interest from your personal PNL for these guys to succeed and to be global beaters, right? But then you've also got a seat at the top table in some of the country's biggest organizations. You, as you have told me on our con call a couple of days ago, <laughs> you're involved in 5G, yeah. you're involved in civil aviation, you're involved with Lotus, you're involved with highways, you're part of the consortium at board level that has taken over, what, five, Gamuda's five highways, four highways, right? So on land, on sea, in the networks, in and the in the, in the it's electricity, right? You have got first dibs and a, a bird, not even bird's eye, you've got like a, a, a first-hand look at how Malaysia does, does business. And the way Malaysia does business is a very unique way of doing business. Some say, some say it cripples Malaysia's entrepreneurial spirit because we can't hold on to them. But some say it's also, you know, a very Mahathir way of doing business, right? What can you tell us about the unique way of Malaysian doing business? I do need to ask you what's a Mahade way of doing business because I don't understand. But um, okay, yeah, I, I have I have some different perspectives. But one of the things I will have to say to you is this: uh, you know, the startups that I've been involved with, yeah. no one gets a free lunch. If I sit on the board of that particular company, it's harder for them to get access to the company than it is if I'm not on the company. And that's because I actually want to impose that kind of discipline to make sure that they know. Uh, that, you know, if you're going to pass through this, you have to do it on your own. And I think the other thing is, uh, when I say I'm an investor in these companies, I actually invest through uh, equity crowdfunding. So like, I'm not like holding 5% or 10%, you know. So please, down a bit, down a bit. You know, that's like, I maybe own about like 500 shares through an oh, ECF. So humble huh? Huh? No, no, it's true, it's true, it's true. <laughs> you know, I, I go through the ECF for one simple reason. I'm too lazy. I'm too lazy to negotiate with the entrepreneur. I'm too lazy to actually run through, uh, you know, this, this uh, evaluation uh, discussion. Um, so I let someone like um, uh, pitch in or lead capital or somebody, one of those e licensed ECF platforms, do the validation, do the due diligence, do all of that. I run through what I see and I say if it's within my uh, sphere of uh, interest and appetite for risk, then I say, can I meet the entrepreneur? And then I go through that. Okay, so one, one ingredient that all our entrepreneurs need uh, above all else is a very good connection, right? And uh, you sit on the board of the DNB, the Digital National Bahad. I see your eyebrows have just bounced up and down. Um, look, I mean, we're still, for want of a better word, we're still faffing around with the network when uh, other countries around the world have come up and are running. To, I think China's testing 7G already, right? That's another example of Malaysia doing, doing business, right? I mean, to the extent that you can, enlighten us. Why does Malaysia do business in this way? Chuang, mm, I, I need to understand what, that, what you mean by what does Malaysia, why does Malaysia do That's business. why I left it abstract. Yeah, 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 I thought so. I, no, I think, um, see, I was involved in my early years in the setup of 3G for the country, um, and then 4G, then I then left public service and went to the private sector. Then suddenly, somehow or other, my past caught up with me, then I now end up on 5G. Um, you know, our journey in this country is actually, uh, uh, we've, we've, 5G is, is a very, um, it's a technology that brings a lot of opportunities, both for uh, SMEs, for entrepreneurs, for uh, the networks itself. 
because of what it promises to do, which is the, you know, 5G has got uh, um, the multi-machine, uh, uh, massive multi-machine operations, uh, I IoT, you know, um, things like smart cars, smart homes, things like that. You've got the hi ultra high speed uh, broadband and ultra low latency. We seem to be focusing a lot on the high speed broadband, which is your 5G mobile phone. Um, but we're not spending enough efforts looking at the other two, you know. What I would like to see, at least on the, in, in the 5G ecosystem, it's not about the, the telcos talking to DNB, DNB taking over, no. What's happening now is because of a few, um, you know, I'll only say what I can say, because of uh, this whole five or six or seven or eight major players wanting to dictate their own terms, the two other quadrants of the triangle, which is the ultra-low latency opportunities, because Malaysia is a huge chipset manufacturer. You just go to Penang, you know this. And the, um, uh, the IoT applications and the, uh, um, and the like don't get an opportunity to be tested in the market. So government, I think, had to step in and move in and create this, uh, start creating this 5G ecosystem. Because if you left it to commercial, it may not start. I think that's that's the extent of what I would like to say, and that's the same with what was done with 3G. That was the same what was done with 4G, except that at that time, I think they allowed the operators to to set up their own networks. Yeah, but as we can see with the supply chain disruptions and the lack of redundancies, which has stopped a lot of supply chains, uh, the original DNB was single point of contact, and you know a lot of fear among players that there was going to be no backup system if that single point of contact the, back, yeah. the backup system is the 4G. You know, I think when you're looking 4G at... 4G as a backup to 5G. Yeah. We talked about how different 5G and 4G is. So, I mean, just from the perspective of the tech ecosystem, right? Mm. We're trying to get into, become the world beaters. We're trying to tell our guys to go out there and conquer the world. But structurally, at a foundational level, we haven't sorted ourselves out. So, what, 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 what kind of sorting out do you think we need to have? I don't know. Maybe we should be faster, more efficient, and you know, get, get onto 5G and you know, get the systems on. And I think that's what we're trying players. to do. We're trying to get onto 5G as quick as we can, but uh, you know, uh, there are other perhaps competing interests who say that you know, they want to do things uh, in their own way. Uh, the industry, for example. Do, do you think that's a Malaysian malaise, these competing interests? No, I think it's a different viewpoint. Uh, for example, some the, depending on where you are in the evolution of the industry and the ecosystem, some jurisdictions actually embrace consolidation of the infrastructure, not necessarily the consolidation of the network. I think we have to be very clear about this, right? So infrastructure consolidation basically means um, you could have a single infrastructure, but have five networks, and that's what we're promising through DNB. So the likes of the telcos that you have today do not have to physically own that network to be able to provide the 5G service. That's what 5G also enables. It's called a MOCAN, a multi-operator core network operations, right? And I don't want to dive into the technicals of it, but the simple fact is, do you need to own your own tower and your own antenna in order to provide 5G? The answer is no. But what they want today is they want to own the tower and they want to own the antenna. I think that's where, that's where the problem lies. And you know, when people talk about, oh, let's have an asset light structure. Well, the one that DNB is offering is actually an asset light structure. One guy builds the infrastructure, five, six, seven of you access it. At holding company level, though, that might hinder the investment process because if they can't control the asset, if, they can't, if there is no asset to control, they might not invest in Malaysia. And some people talk about the Malaysian discount, Cheryl. Um, I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to build a, te a technology ecosystem. And um, entrepreneurs, I guess, I mean, maybe within the US, they don't have those issues to consider because it's a bit more mature in terms of the network. No, they have their own problems on 5G. The 5G in the US actually encroached on the civil aviation frequencies, and that created a whole series of other problems. That was because the telco lobby was going one way, the FCC couldn't stop it, and then the FAA came in, you know? Uh, so you could also end up things like that. I mean, fortunately, in this country, we, we don't do that. In, in Asia, we're a little bit more um, 
I suppose, conciliatory in our approach. So we're not extending the 5G ban beyond as to what the US is doing. Uh, so there are always those, those kind of implications. But back to your point here today, look, let me be very uh, uh, specific about this. 20 years ago, I was promoting the idea of infrastructure sharing. I wrote the first white paper on infrastructure sharing when I was first round in MCMC. I was laughed at, I was poo-pooed at, and so on and so on. Fine, no problem. 10 years later, the telco say, hey, tower sharing is a great thing. Major tower companies popped up around the world, American Towers. Um, here in Malaysia, we now have two. We have uh, E.co, we have Edgepoint. But guess what? Those same guys who are running those companies ten, you know, in, in the year 2000 when I wrote that paper saying you can share this infrastructure and you don't have to own it, actually laughed at me and said, Charles, you don't know what you're talking about. And it wasn't an original idea. That idea back then was based on a company called Crown Castle in the, U in the UK. And there was also, uh, this was being done in Sweden where in the rural areas, Telia and Tele2 were sharing infrastructure and yet keeping their own brands. So I personally think, uh, now you've got me started on this particular thing, you know, the, the operators that we have in this country, I, I don't blame them because they're looking at things from their perspective. But what I would say is open up your lenses a bit more and look at things from beyond. Because why? An operator actually owns the relationship between the, his network and his business and his consumer. Does it matter who owns the network in between to get from me to you? Well, technically, no lah. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't. And it shouldn't, right? And the consumer should be able to decide, for example, the best service provider that you choose at the price point that you want. You know, when I was a regulator then, I implemented this thing called number portability. You can change your service provider if you don't like them. Of course, they then run you through some circles and hoops, but now I hope you can do that because that, 10 years ago that I did that. But, but you see... Businesses don't like disruption. Businesses don't like change because that, that changes the status quo. But that's what being innovative, being an entrepreneur, being entrepreneurial in your approach to, to, to constantly challenge the status quo. And what's happening now with DNB and 5G, we're challenging the status quo. Yes. The, the government, though, is still very strong, right? And some people might say that government, <clears throat> in fact, all business, not just entrepreneurs, all business want as, as small a government as possible because then they can do, you know, work within a, a freer landscape. Malaysia continues to have a big government, Singapore as well. That's why you can say maybe Singapore doesn't foment as many entrepreneurs as Malaysia does. It does a great job of taking our best and brightest, but it doesn't generate the best entrepreneurs. We have tons of good, good, good guys, right? So do you think there'll ever come a day when Malaysia, you know, lets the private sector do its own thing? I think it is. I mean, look at what we're doing now, the, the highway the highway takeover that I'm involved in, right? That's entirely a private sector initiative. Um, you know, uh, where we had a situation where the government was, you know, obviously finding it increasingly difficult to pay uh, compensation payments per the concession contracts. Um, then you have the businesses who, you know, who contractually can claim for, for the compensation payments. And finding there's a detente, you know, there's a, there's a literally a head-on collision between the two interests. Uh, so basically, ALR Amanat Boraya was set up to 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 take away that tension, uh, become a vessel uh, of, um, if you like, a a hold, you know, a sort of a business trust to take over the infrastructure and then deal with the bondholders, raise sukuks, deal with the bondholders, and and pay off the loans. And all sides. Uh, um, a benefit. I mean, again, this idea is not that original. If you remember the days when Dana Harta was first set up, I think some of you in the room would know. Uh, Zico helped set up Dana Harta back then. Plug for Zico. Um, and, and why was it done? Uh, it was government, but it was then done through a government mechanism that then helped the private sector. Why? Because you needed to warehouse those loans that were going bad, otherwise all the banks would have just collapsed due to the NPLs. So, you know, I think there's a lot of room for government and private sector to work together, uh, which, is, which is where my experience comes from, right? But, and it's not about, uh, you know, who's doing better or who's doing less good, but it's about 
what is the role that government can play? What is the role that private sector can play? What is the role that the individual, the entrepreneur can play? And I think if we all understood our roles in each ecosystem and then are able to have a conversation to then manage the expectations, that's where you start finding solutions. Yeah, but many a time that uh, government doesn't engage uh, as closely as business would like. just want to raise the example of, say, e-hailing. Yeah? I mean, we're trying to solve inner city congestion, inner city pollution, emissions reductions. Every country has got its, you know, its nationally defined contributions mm -hmm. to COP26 and what have you. And then out of the blue, um, the transport ministers outlaws e-hailing. We've got three or four players. Ugia is one of them. Um, I, I can't remember the other players. And then overnight, their model is completely destroyed. And, and they tell me, uh, you know, firsthand, the government has not discussed anything with them. And overnight, they're at, in limbo. Their investors are asking them what's going on. So this is an example where government is not just disruptive in a bad way, but it's also highly inflationary because it drives up their cost. Inflation in the wrong sense of the word. So e-hailing is... So not e-hailing. Um, scooters. E ah, scooters. Ha, ha. okay, okay, okay. So it's like, like okay, oh, e-hailing, yeah. Did I, miss, scooter, scooter. did I miss a headline? Yeah, you know those things that you see? Okay, yeah. okay, the e-scooters. That's right. All right, I, I think, look, maybe what we probably don't do well enough, I think, is... Um, communicating the engagement. I believe consultations were done, engagements were done, but somehow maybe the, the information didn't get through. Again, I don't know the specifics of that, but what I do know is this. We need to draw a distinction between um, what's safe and what's unsafe, right? We have existing road transport laws that nobody bothers to read. There is a minimum standard of what you need to have on a public on a vehicle before it goes onto a public road, for example. A lot of times what's happening with our and then we have classifications of you know bicycle, motorized vehicle, and then motorcars. A lot of times what happens is that people sort of fail to understand the the, the, the functionalities. Now what what I will say is we do have bad sidewalks. That's the issue we have, right? Because so a lot of times what happens is that these e-scooters, which are supposed to be only operating on a sidewalk or pavement, depending on whether you're British or uh, you know, American, end up on the roads where they shouldn't be. I think that, that's, that's a, a deeper problem. But that problem is a problem that you know, I would call upon all local authorities, please, please, you know, when you're doing your road resurfacing, please make sure the sidewalks are good. Because I, I try and walk a bit, you know, half the time I end up in a pothole somewhere. And, you know, it doesn't take the government, the big G, to do that. It takes all of us in the community going to your local assemblyman, going to your local, um, uh, you, you know, majlis or whatever, and telling them, please fix the, the thing. And, you know, so I, I'm, this is what I say about, uh, what, I, what, what, what I'm trying to say is this, right? We can look at all the big problems that, Everybody has, you know, any country has, you know, well, there's a big thing, a federal government, state government. No, look, I, I will tell you that I can't solve that, those kind of problems myself. None of us, probably collectively, maybe we can, but individually it's hard. But let's start from the bottom. Let's start with what we can do, right? So one of the things that our community, for example, has done where I live is that we keep the majlis on their toes and say, you know, we send photos, we send information, we do, we do things like that because why we want a better community. So the community is working together. And the same with uh, the ecosystem that we're trying to create here in, in, in the entrepreneurs. So if we can't rely on agency A, business B, entity C, what can we do together? And that's one of the things that Endeavour uh, stands for. Do you think there's a disconnect between gov what government knows and believes in and what entrepreneurs know and believe in? Um, I think in every part of the world, in every every country, there's probably some disconnect. Otherwise, I'd be lying to say that there's none. But look, you know, there are many also countries who have had um, difficulties in their political system, uh, political uncertainty, but the country has done well. I'll give you an example. Australia, government changes every three years. Country still doing okay, right? Uh, okay, contrast Singapore, which is same government for so many years. But there are many other examples like that. New Zealand, for a long time also, they keep switching every few years. But the community says, no, we're going to keep the government, whichever government comes, on the straight and narrow. Because we need 
these basic minimums to be done, whoever comes into power. I think that's one of the things that we as Malaysians need to understand. What can we do amongst ourselves without even having to rely on a government uh, uh, support? Well, some would say a change in government is necessary. Even yeah, MNCs rotate their CEOs out every three years because they need a fresh change of perspective. Yeah, yeah but, but you know, you change, then you change, then you change. It's a bit like, uh, uh, like which, which country was it? I can't remember now. But you know, they keep changing the government and they find it's the same old thing. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think the distinction between Malaysia and, and Australia is that there was a democratic process in Australia, uh, but we've had three or, or in changes of government in Malaysia, only one of which was voted on. Uh, but, but to not dwell on that, I, I think the key <laughs> point is, is, is the Malaysia issue, right? For, for growing our entrepreneurs, right? Mm. We, we want to have as many customs and as many grabs as possible. We need to give them a landscape on which they can rely on and forecast reliably off and maybe grow off and springboard from. Yep. Um, just in terms of, for example, the digital banking landscape, right? Mm. And this is on public record because I spoke to him just a few days ago and he said on, on public radio, um, the money match guy, he said that, you know, in all probability, in the, in the medium term, they would probably have to, you know, f seek um, uh, um, Series B funding and, and beyond that in Singapore and Hong Kong because Malaysia doesn't have the te technical wherewithal to evaluate properly uh, financial services at, at a much higher level. And it, it made me think that we've been trying to get off, uh, ourselves off the ground since the MSE days when Tun Mahathir started the, you know, our, our corridors, right, with the Internet Advisory Panel. Um, we, we're, still, we're still, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to get our engines in the gear, but it just seems as if we're being held back a little bit, right? Um, I mean, Grab is listed in New York, might seek a listing parallel in Asia. Um, Kasim, I mean, you know, our drone, you know, we've got one of the biggest drone companies in the world. He might list in Japan or America, I don't know, but definitely not a parallel one in Malaysia. Yeah, but is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything wrong for Aerodyne to list in Japan? Is there anything wrong for Grab to list in Singapore or New York or wherever it is? I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we probably need to look at, again, you know, Lotus. It's a British brand. It's Chinese-owned, but it's still a British brand. The question we have to ask ourselves is what do we want as Malaysians, right? Um, certain realities we probably have to face. Uh, our capital markets attracting the kind of uh, large institutional international funds, probably not right now. Uh, we have some, but not as good. But does, should that stop the entrepreneur? It goes back to the thing. Whenever I speak to an entrepreneur, I say, look, if you don't have an ASEAN strategy, don't talk to me. If you don't have an Asia regional strategy, don't talk to me. And I cannot, by the same token, after telling the entrepreneur that, say, hey, you only list in Malaysia. No. And I think that's the one of the things that, for example, uh, your legal group here, Zico Group, right? I was in the early days in Zico. I was in Zico in 97 to 2000. We were a single law firm in Kuala Lumpur. We dreamt big and then we went out regional. Now they're in 10 countries. It's a Malaysian brand. So either we sit and wallow and say, oh, you know, government don't do this, government don't do that, ini salah, itu salah, ini betul, tak betul. You take the bull by the horns. I mean, myself, Chu Seng Kok and all that, we did it. You know, we, we took Zico to 10, 12 countries. And... Um, Tell me which Singapore brand has that. And then guess what? Zico is, well, the organization that I've worked for is listed in Singapore. But the reality is that's where the capital market was because uh, when I think the regulators were approached here, they were not ready to list a multidisciplinary service firm where Singapore was. So yeah, there are certain things that the regulators here need to look at. We, we were ahead on certain things, then we sort of fell behind. Because you know what? It's not difficult to be number one. It's hard to stay number one. I think that, that, that's really the thing that we as Malaysians need to understand. You know? To stay number one, you've got to constantly be at it. You know? But we tend to go like, oh, sudah nombor satu, cukup lagi. It doesn't work that way. So with the world changing so fast, right, Jarel? Um, it's very volatile. How would you advise entrepreneurs to you know, really take the bull by the horns, as you say, and try and springboard into the region as fast as you can? Because... It is a fast coalescing region, you know, 700 million people, mm. two, what, three trillion dollars in combined GDP. Yep. I mean, Vietnam is you know, leaping forward with huge gusto. Mm. Um, Thailand, you know, no, no difference. Indonesia is 
way ahead now in terms of FDI. Uh, how, how does the, what kind of advice can you impart to the entrepreneur to, to really get into the region? Well, if, you, if you're looking at any entrepreneur, whether it's tech or non-tech, you need to understand what you think you can do to solve what problem in which country. And you, there's no excuse of not going down deep. You cannot skim the surface and think you can be a unicorn. It doesn't work that way. You Very few, very few. I mean, look, the days of Facebook, the days of Jack Dorsey, the days of Twitter, that, that's all gone. Entrepreneurs of today, if you're going to be in that tech space, it's going to be harder. I've actually moved away from that kind of tech, so I've gone more into deep tech now, but deep tech has a longer gestation period. So I have a data analytics firm that I work with in, 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 Palo, in, in, well, in San Francisco. And there's another, uh, you know... Deep tech is scary, man. Yeah, yeah you talk to me separately, but that's, <laughs> that's deep tech and AI. But, um, but, you know, so I'm constantly pushing the boundary myself, personally, and trying to learn stuff, you know, and there's stuff that I know I cannot learn because I just don't understand. But there's some that I, I, try, I, I, I try to work on. But I think the, the, the advice I would give is that if you look at the vertical, look at the industry vertical that you want to look at. Again, I started looking at tech 20 over years ago and I started seriously investing in the last seven years, right? But you've got to look at the industry vertical that you want to play in. And before you start and make that first pitch, do your research. Do understand the market. And when I say understand the market, not just you and your friends surrounding you. Look at the region, look at where you're going to extend. So there's a lot of preparatory work. And then put your thoughts down on paper because talk is cheap. Okay, to, to drill down, how do you do the research? A ASEAN is notoriously thin on data and some of it is quite expensive to buy from the PwCs of this world. No, actually ASEAN is, well, again, the sector that you want to go into, some, some may have uh, very little data, but very often you can find corollaries, you can find analysis uh, in related sectors. So, you know, look, no one's gonna Chuang, No one's gonna give you on a platter. Oh, I want to do, uh, for example, I want to do healthcare. Say, uh, okay, I invested in one of the healthcare companies. You you can't go and say, uh, can you give me all the data on all healthcare in ASEAN? Can I just push you back on that because mm -hmm. I know you've invested in Bookdog, right? Mm -hmm. Bookdog's founder is a guy called uh, Dato Chevy Bay. Chevy Bay's family are quite wealthy, right? So I think when he started the business, he didn't really have to think about can I pay salaries this month. A lot of entrepreneurs. They are facing, you know, <laughs> salary day, right? Some of them, they may not even have money to pay salary. So time, they, I mean, they're they are packing boxes, they're manning social media, they're motivating. Them. I mean, they're doing 20 different things, right? Mm. Um, it's nice to have the data, but at a real level. Well, specifically on BookDog, again, I, can, I, can, I can't comment for the other startups, but I can tell you this. Um, you know, the three... The five of us that sort of started, Chevy, uh, Joel, Joel Neo, um, and then there were three other team members that they have, and then I was the first external outside investor out of that cohort. Um, they were bootstrapping. There's no family money there. But they were not poor. La. But they were bootstrapping. All of them were bootstrapping. They all came up, I mean, they all started with a very uh, small seed capital. What I can it's say... It's a very different mentality, you know, when you've got that p and and that balance sheet behind you. Yeah, you might be bootstrapping, but it's not the same as like, can I pay for my salary this month, you know? Not my salary, you know, staff salary. It's a very different mentality. Um, yeah, some of that might rub off, but uh, I can say in the journey that I've been with them in the last uh, six and a half uh, years or so, because I, I sort of helped them out uh, six months after they first set up, and it's not just me as an investor, there are other investors. But this young man was quite uh, shrewd in identifying the key mentors that he could work with, the key investors that he could work with. Because why? He had the benefit of having been in the health ecosystem, in the family Healthcare, business, yeah. in the family business yeah. 10 years prior and decided to then strike out on his own. So... So he wasn't a freshman when it comes to the healthcare business. He had built his business contacts and network and made it easier for him to start. And that applies to any entrepreneur. So build your knowledge in a related industry before forging out on your own. Yeah. That's a lesson. I think so. Because I almost never 
look at or invest in someone right out of college. Unless they're Jack Dorsey, but that's another story, right? But, uh, no, but, but in all seriousness, you know, so somebody who comes out of university and says to me, oh, I've got a, the next billion dollar unicorn idea, I'll say, okay, I'll give you 30 seconds, tell me what it is. But very often, you don't. And I think what you're seeing now with a lot of uh, angel investors like myself, we now tend to invest or work with older entrepreneurs. So my current cohort of entrepreneurs, they're not 20-somethings that I work with. They're all in their mid-30s. They've failed once, they've failed twice. They've had one startup that's failed, one burn, one half-fledgling. Because it's important for them to go through that kind of exercise, you know. And, and, and it prepares you. It prepares you mentally, it prepares you financially, it prepares you from, uh, you know, from making the same mistakes as you go along. So, again, I'm not putting down younger entrepreneurs, uh, people in their 20s who want to do that, but uh, the only challenge I would say to them is research, right? And nothing beats that little bit of experience, falling down, scraping your knee, making mistakes, because that's part of the learning process of becoming an entrepreneur. What is the one rule to govern them all, Sharil, when it comes to succeeding, succeeding in entrepreneurship? Is there one, one ring to rule them all? Yeah. Honesty. Honesty. What I cannot take is an entrepreneur that's not honest. Because, and I think that applies to any business, it's not just uh, you know, entrepreneurship. It applies to uh, uh, whether you're working in an organization, whether you're working in a law firm, an accounting firm. Honesty and integrity. Because if the entrepreneur cannot be honest and have integrity with himself or herself or with his, team mem his or her team members or a cohort of people that they're working with, that startup is doomed to failure. A bit like Adam Newman's uh, WeWork, right? But he's coming back for second dibs. Oh, um, some <laughs> people get that chance, you know? Some yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. No, but, but, but I, I think do, do you think do you think there's room for embellishment though? Because I mean, we're trying to, you know, um, promote a business plan, right? There, there's an element of guesswork, and you've got to be convincing at the same time, and therein lies some embellishment. So, so Americans, you might say that they're very good at that, hmm. right? They're very good at talking big ideas, <laughs> but, I, but but it's convincing, yeah, yeah, right? No, but they I, may not be, they may not be the most honest in terms of knowing everything. Oh, but you know, there, there are also a lot of entrepreneurs in this part of the world from a country that I shall not name, but it's, it's within the six, seven hundred million. Well, actually, they're maybe closer to a billion. They also embellish quite a bit, but I think, <laughs> I think there is a distinction between embellishment and, and lying, right? There is that distinction because you can, you can embellish. The truth will come out eventually, and many, many investors today are very, very seasoned, right? Uh, so you can you can tell a lie, you can tell a lie, you can tell you can embellish, embellish, but after after a while you start polishing that embellishment. And you say, oh, okay, what's the core? There's no core, and that's it. You're dead. Sharil, I mean, uh, it's, it's it's this conversation has been a bit unusual in the sense that I tried to put you on the spot. So I th thank you for your, um, you know, for being a good sport and for trying to answer as honestly as you can, which you have. And you know, three key takeaways from your responses has been that integrity is important. Um, go into the region as fast as you can, and um, you know, work hard, lah. You know, there's no substitute for that, as you say. Um, back to you, Amira, and I think we.